I like to start every day with a thought. And so, two thoughts. One is from Elsa Broberg, and one from my daughter. Patriarchal Blessing, which I need to give permission. This is the one that's uh, on a mission now. Elder Broberg said this. He says, what is your mission in life? What does God expect you to accomplish during your sojourn here upon the earth? And are you doing it? To help answer these questions, I hope the Spirit of the Lord will impress upon you the importance of at least three, these three eternal truths. One, God our Father in heaven does have a specific mission for all of us to fulfill and perform while we are here upon the earth. Two, we can hear and now in this life discover what that mission is. And three, with his help we can fulfill that mission and know and have assurance here and now that we are doing that which is pleasing to him. With the help of the Spirit of the Lord, we can understand these truths and move the course of our life. And then the second one again is, is from my daughter's patriarch of Weston, who says this. And I think it's applicable to all of us. It says this, anything you desire to do, you will be able to achieve. Set your goals high. Push yourself to your limits. Or you have the ability within you to accept. So you never guess what are we talking about today? Goals. Um, one of the one of the things that, um, as part of your service teaching, you're, you're required to do four certain four hours. We gave you a couple of options. We'll talk a little bit about the Money Wise seminars in a little bit. But another one is called the International Family Initiative. And so I asked Caitlin, uh, she would come and just do a give us a a short introduction about that initiative. So. It said it's going to take a minute. <coughs> Come up and run. Awesome, that's good. All right, so I'm Caitlin Erickson. I work for Desert News KSL. How many of you guys read Desert News KSL? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, that's quite a few. That's good. That's better than I need to get. Um, to start out, I just want to ask you a question. So, say uh, President Obama called you up and says we're doing a special broadcast, and I want you to be the speaker. And it's going to go out to the world, and you can say whatever you want to say. The sky's the limit. Um, what would you say? What are your ideas? What would you say to 18 million people? Anybody? Nothing? You would say nothing? Um, okay, give me at least a couple of things. Steve, here, Jeff. Go. So is this to is this to the world? This is to the world. What would you say? I don't know. I, if I had that demographic, I'd probably choose to see something related to the gospel. Yeah. Um, some core belief that I have that, that brought me happiness that I would suspect. I, I don't know that, that I would think that maybe other people don't know that I want to. That's a great answer. I think a lot of people would agree with what you said. So last night I threw that out to one of our social media groups and we got a bunch of different answers. One person said that they would ask everybody for a dollar, which I thought was really smart. Um, another person said that they would ask everybody for a thing of beer, which I thought was a little less um, appropriate. Um, there were other things. One lady said that she had a kid with autism, and so she thought that the kid was very misunderstood. So she would want to say something about autism. One person said that he would tell everybody that he loved them, which I thought was kind of sweet and chilly. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, we're starting a new site called FamilyShare.com in the Desert News Group. So we have Desert News and KSL, and this is separate from them. And it's a site all about building and strengthening families. And our goal is to take this site to the world. So when we started, we bought up 100 domains in 100 different countries and 25 different languages. So we're starting out here in the United States and Brazil, and then we're going to go to Spanish-speaking countries next, and then we're going to go to Indonesia. And uh, what our content is, is practical solutions for families. So uh, they did a study once where, you know when they have jars of candy and everybody is supposed to come together and guess how many you know, gumballs or M&Ms are in that jar? Well, they found if you take everybody's answers and average it, it's usually a really, really close answer um, to what the real answer is. So if you ever have to play that game again, just look through the list and average everybody's answers out, and then you'll probably get the right answer. So that's kind of the goal of our site. Let's take a bunch of people together and ask them for answers, and then hopefully the best answers come out. And so what we need from you guys is a bunch of finance articles. 
the hard thing about finance articles is that you have to take um, hard concepts and make them simple for people to understand. And so that's why I think it's a great um, exercise for you guys to do, because it's a way, one, for you to learn to write better, um, two, work with an editor, and then um, three, be able to learn how to talk about complicated principles that you learn in class and then share them with other people. And our hope is that we can uh, come up with articles that will help families. So how to budget so your kid can go to college, or how to get out of debt, uh, principles like that. So I'm going to show you, this is how you um, propose a story. So we do everything called uh, on a site called Desert Connect. So uh, I've given all the instructions to Dr. Sadiq, so he can give it to you. They're, they're on the uh, uh, learning suite. It's the, that PowerPoint that you gave me last semester. Yeah, we have a PowerPoint. It's very simple. The articles are short. It's not a dissertation. It's not even five pages long. Uh, our articles are short and sweet. They're 500 to 1,000 words long. And we ask you to stay away. We want them to be shorter than longer because if any of you guys have been web -reading, if there's a second page, you probably won't go on the second page. So we want things that are short so that if a mom is at the grocery store line and she's going through and she has some time, she can read an article really quick. Um, and so that will give you all uh, of the specifications you want for the articles. Um, and then this is where you will put your article. So you'll sign up for an account and you'll tell me and then I'll go in and add you to our group on this site. And then you just put your story, you plug it in here, you can copy and paste from Word if you want to write it in Word. And then you submit it. And then we have editors that will go through and edit you and then kind of help you. Um, so if you're not the best writer, don't be afraid. We will help you. Um, we'll help you refine it. So don't let your lack of writing skills scare you, because I know that finance is more math than not writing. So this is kind of where you'll send the story, and then we will publish it out on our site. And I'll, put, I'll just show you our site real quick. So we're still in beta, um, so there's still problems here and there, but this is kind of what the site looks like. We have a bunch of main topics, and they're on the side. So this is money-wise. This is where you'll send, um, This is where your stories will show up. And uh, here's just a couple ideas of things that people have written. Um, top five things to know and do before buying the use of art. Um, when the bling from holiday ringing, it requires serious teaching. How to teach your kids to be smart shoppers. Top things to know when looking for a house to rent. Tips for shopping cheaply. Um, is buying real estate and nothing down easy and as smart as it sounds? Financial secrets to successful budgeting. So the sky's the limit. I think that you guys are the best ones to come up with article titles. Um, I got my MBA, so I kind of know finance, but I think you guys know a lot uh, deeper than I do. So you can think of titles that maybe I can't think of just because you know the subject better. So you can either choose from a title that I've come up with, or you can come up with your own title and propose it, and then I'll just go through and um, approve all of those proposals. But they're great articles. They're fun to read. Every article um, we put with a little image quote, and those are highly shareable. Um, yesterday we found out we did all of our statistics for our social media sharing. Um, so we have 18 million followers on our social media. So anytime that we get a really good article, we push it out to our social media followers, and we get crazy amounts of shares. So one time we posted one picture on one Facebook page, and it was seen by over a million people. And if you think about it, Desert News and KSL are pretty small in comparison to CNN or you know, one of those big <laughs> news sites. And so it's pretty amazing how much of a reach we get. Another thing, too, is that our best articles are translated and, and pushed out to different countries. And so right now we're launching in Brazil. And Brazil doesn't have very many finance articles. So most of our finance articles are going to be translated into at least Portuguese from the beginning. So, and you notice, too, that your names are on there. Yes. So if you have one article, again, that's uh, considered one hour of service teaching. Generally, with service teaching, I figure it's going to take an hour to prepare, an hour to give it, and an hour to write up. And so uh, we encourage you to do this. It's a way, uh, again, of going beyond the university. And so. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. For this and we appreciate the opportunity and so I don't know exactly how many articles we submitted last semester but if we can continue to build uh, the work that we're doing here and now um, you can do up to two of your hours can be uh, service uh, to be uh, you can trip two articles and that'll, that'll take up half of your service uh, teaching right but we appreciate that thank you yeah. okay <coughs> let me start with an email this is email it's from my wife's husband's sister's husband. I have no idea what that makes us. 
for a problem. Well, but here it is. Wait, your wife's says, husband? Your wife's husband. My wife's husband's That's you. sister's <laughs> husband. My brother-in-law's brother-in-law. I guess that's right. Something like that. Your wife's husband. Your wife's husband. Your wife's sister's husband. I hope that. It sounds like a recording. That's Okay. He says, Brian, hope you had a terrific Christmas and enjoying a new year. And then he goes on. He says, this February, I'll be holding the third annual Stone Family Financial Seminar. Mother, among other things, I have tried to teach the principles of real estate investment to the Stone nieces and nephews in a way that they might desire to become more interested in the family business. I have had only minor success, as I suppose most of them will listen out of a courtesy, but not with real interest. This year, I want to take a little different approach. This year, I will be presenting the same PowerPoint presentation I gave at BYU on success in business and what that really means. However, I feel impressed to expand the presentation to include more about the difference in consuming assets now versus saving and investing for the future. I'm watching as a number of these kids, in quotes, spend large sums of money on purchasing adult toys as if there is no tomorrow instead of planning and investing for the future. I'm looking for a good presentation material that I could use to drive home the idea that a wise steward would save and not consume his assets. As you know, things change and the income one might be counting on today to pay the bills may not always be available. Can you help me? Any ideas or resource material would be most appreciated. So what's Mike requesting? <coughs> what, what, what does he want? First of all, what's he trying to do to, all, to the Stone nieces and nephews? Yes? Right. Encourage them to save and invest rather than to spend. It's Kinantia. Mm -hmm. So save, save and invest instead of spend. Needless to say, this email was written about five years ago, before the real estate market hit. What else is he trying to do? So he wants him to save and invest. What's he trying to teach the stone nieces, nieces and nephews? I feel like he's trying to help them realize the things that you like now may not necessarily be important to them. May not be necessarily important. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say unpredictability. I mean, it was five years ago, and look what happened. And so they might have been relying on counting on certain things. And they didn't come to pass. So in essence, is he telling them that they, he wants them to really try to figure out their financial life, try to figure out what's important, important to them? You think he's, in his essence, trying to help them to really put together a financial plan? Something to think about what's, what's happening in life. And I think, to a degree, that's what, uh, what he wants them, wants them to do. As we, as we go through the class, the first slide will always be our objectives. And we'll actually work on most of these. Not every day I'll talk about every objective. But the second slide is what do we need to do for our personal financial plan? So today what we need to do is I want you to get a binder. Section one is your introduction. <coughs> I want to get you a, want you to get a binder. Get a family picture on it and get, and you want it, something like this, your personal financial plan. I don't think this really had enough time to get around to everybody. But if you already saw it on Tuesday, uh, you can pass it through. So if you want to personalize it with having your pers the personal financial plan of yourself if you're single, or you and your spouse if you're married, 16 tabs, these are kind of the recommended tabs I give here. These are the cheap ones, you can get more expensive. My TA here used the expensive plastic tabs, you don't need tabs. But I prefer the ones you can print off, and it has to be printed tabs, not numbered for printed. In fact, I encourage you guys to, encourage each of you to come by and spend time with you. If you come by, I actually have the tabs printed, and all you have to do is buy the, buy the actual things there, and I'll give you a printed set of tabs, and you give me the unprinted version. So I want to encourage you to come by and spend some time with me. Um, office hours, instructions for office hours are now on uh, Learning Suite, so the, the account name. And so I encourage you to, yeah, it's better to do it during the scheduled times. Uh, but I encourage you to come by. And then, so what you want to do in about two weeks, you're, uh, we're actually going to have you just, I'll have TA at one side and I'll be at the other and we'll just kind of check off that you've got that. But I want the booklet done. so. Um, so what we can do is after you have sections that are, that are passed off and are graded, you can put them right in your book. 
Um, second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about goals. And so the goals section, let me tell you how important goals are. Goals are 40% of your grade of your personal financial plan. Now, grading goals is somewhat arbitrary, so I've decided to split that. So half of it is, 30% of it is your grade. And you, so you get grade, and 70% of it's mine. And I'm grading effort and not content. So realize that. So 30% your grade, 70% mine, and I'm grading you against 12 years and 5,000 personal financial plans that I've, uh, that I've worked. So what does Heavenly Father want you to do, do or be? Detailed, specific, uh, complete. <coughs> what are your top three goals? And then uh, what things will keep you from attaining your goals? And a lot of times that's, that's an important part. And then I want you to write your epitaph. And your epitaph is something short. Uh, um, one of the cool, cool ones that I read a little while back, their epitaph was just really short. It was three words. It was return to the honor. And, and the reason we want you to do an epitaph is how do you want to be remembered? And I don't need, a, you know, he was married and had 12 kids and 69 grandkids. I don't, you know, that's not what I want. Mine will say this. He was an investor in the truest sense of the word. He invested his life in things that outlasted in service to his, his God, his family, his God. Take him and just sit down and share that. So questions on, oh, and then finally is the action plan. What are you going to do to get to those goals? What are your short-term goals, one year or less? What are your medium-term goals? So the thing about the goal section is I encourage you to spend, you're going to have all semester to hand that in. But I would encourage you to do that. I think that, that's very appropriate for Sunday. Things to, to sit down and think, well, what's important? And needless to say, on my, on my goal section, about the only thing numbers I have are really the page numbers and the percentages you know, that I'm going to save and the percentages I'm going to give. So realize it, it doesn't have to, the, the numbers there, don't make the numbers daunting. Okay. So do we understand the assignment? Okay. Let's talk. Why do we do financial planning? So why don't you take two minutes? Why don't you get into your groups? Um, I like to hear people talking, and I like to see people moving. <laughs> so um, one of the other things I have in this class is my computer policy is you can use your computer to take notes, to review PowerPoints, or do things that we're talking about. It's not appropriate for you to do email, internet, because what happens, you're looking at your computer and the three people behind you are being distracted by what. So out of respect to your, even if there's not someone behind you, out of respect to your, your colleagues, please only use the computers for, uh, again, the things that we do in class. Okay, so why do financial planning? So take a couple of minutes.
Um, I was talking about personally, like, um, I tend to like get distracted if I don't have a plan. I might change my plan every two months, just the way I am, but it keeps me focused. kind of is liberating in a way that you can, after you pay off the bills that have to be paid, you can know how much money you have left over to do other things that you want to do. Okay. Can I make a confession? Last few weeks I have not updated my budget. <laughs> Needless to say, a week ago my wife says, you know, we're running a little bit short on cash in the, in the checking account, and I have a, an account of Charles Schwab and another one at the local bank. And what happens when we get, the, when we get I see we get needs down, we kind of pull pull money from that and so so uh, Tuesday I sold, sold sold some shares but it takes a while between selling the mutual fund and getting the cash and I had like two days or one day of liquidity problem and so I think we, 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 my wife and I we were kind of going through the homework and uh, okay what's it going to cost if, if our, our you know we're late one day on the credit card payment because it was due on Tuesday and so we had to make the decision and we figured okay well what's a late payment you know, if you do a minimum payment, you have to pay the. You do a minimum payment, you have to pay the. Uh, the interest charges. So I actually went through and I did the analysis, and I found if I took a signature loan out, you know, it would cost me uh, about two dollars in interest. And and you know, we, I was figuring out all these things. I could do a wire from the uh, from the brokerage account, and an incoming wire transfer fee is ten bucks. <laughs> And so I thought, I'll just do a signature loan. It's only 4.99%. It cost me $2 a day. And so I went into the bank, and I hate to admit that I actually did that. I, I, I don't think I've taken out a loan for 10 years. And it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't huge. But the lady, you know, she, she ran my credit score. And she, she, she ran my credit score. You know, I'm like 7 I need to. And she says, you've never taken out a loan here. And I said, no, and I hope I never have to take out another one again. Mm -hmm. Part of the things that we're in right now is, do we set the habits? You know, can, do we, it is liberating to know that you know, your house is paid for. It's liberating to know that you don't know anything, anything except for your father. You know that you have the resources there to be able to, to pay those things. Other reasons on why we do, you know, and again, sometimes I'm a little bit slow and I, I'm like everybody else. Yes. You have more certainty in your life. Like there, there are something that you cannot plan for in your life, but you can plan well on this finance part. Yeah, more certainty. There's a peace that comes from that. Are there thoughts here? Why did you find it to find? Take. Um, well, one of the reasons is, is uh, going back to the eternal perspective. Uh -huh. Is uh, in order to fulfill the missions that God has sent us here to fulfill, we have to make sure that we have a plan to uh, to have resources to do that. And whether it be a mission or whether it be um, being able to quit your job and yeah. serve the church in whatever way it needs to be done. So. Would you like to be in a position at, at 845 or something like that? You could actually quit what you wanted to do instead of what you had to do. Yeah. Yes? I think uh, it's important to, as far as unifying families. You know, uh, I've been married for like 18 months, so I'm obviously super experienced. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Sometimes it's you hard. still know all the answers. Yeah, there you are. It's hard to communicate about money yeah. sometimes. And I've seen people in my family who have very, the husband and wife have totally different financial goals. And it's a big strain on their marriage. So I think if we can play it early with our spouses, if we have, then it'll be a lot of So, yes, well, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, any um, kind of knowledge or planning that we gain in this life, going back to the eternities, will be beneficial as well. Sure, how important you know 401k limits, and yes. <laughs> but yeah, let me share what uh, President Benson said. This he said, plan for your financial future as you move through life toward retirement and the decades which follow. We invite all to plan frugally for the years following full time employment. Be ever, even more cautious about get rich quick schemes, mortgaging homes, or investing in uncertain ventures. Proceed cautiously so one or a series of poor financial decisions. Oh, so, you, uh, so a lifetime is not disrupted by one or more of a series of poor financial decisions. Plan your financial future early, then follow the plan. So it's kind of neat in this class we're actually following what a prophet is saying, because that's what we want to do. We're planning your financial future early. And 
will follow that plan. Um, what's the process of financial planning? So if these are kind of the reasons we do it, what's the process? What are the steps? There's six steps. Yes? Well, first figuring out where you are to find financial health. Okay. So, actually, you're actually. So, second one is that is evaluate your health. Figure out where you are right now. You can't get to where you want to go unless you know where you are. Yes? You have some goals. Okay. So, and, and part of that is really decide what you want. <clears throat> so, decide what you want. Decide what's important to you. Um, number two is evaluate your health. Number three, and I think that's really where you are. You want to define. Four. So decide what you want, which is what are the things that are important to you. Number two, evaluate your health. Where are you right now? Where are you on your budget? Remember, I was a college student, graduated with my MBA, and I did not want to balance my checkbook because I was scared on how fast. <laughs> so I probably went three months without doing that. <laughs> Four, we're going to develop your plan. Five, basically implement. And six. Um, What we do in this class here, we'll do the first four steps. And so we handed that personal financial plan. So the first question is decide what you want. How do you figure out what's important to you? How do you figure out what's important to you? Yes? I think you have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah, you've got to spend a lot of time thinking. Because it's a personal decision for all of us. All of yep. our goals are going to be different. All of our goals are going to Are we going to have some common goals? Some of them, yep. but for the most part, my goals are going to be very different. Yeah. So you don't want to climb Pilot Peak in Nevada? No. That has no interest for you. You don't want to run a marathon on the Great Wall of China. You don't want to do that either. No. So we do have so how do we figure out what's important? I think it's from the reading, but I liked how it suggested. It's Joni, right? Yes. Joni Morris. I liked how it suggested that we look at the end, start at the end, and then move backwards. So how do we want people to look at this guy? And I feel like that will hopefully show us what is important to us. How we want people to look at this guy and then move backwards. Okay. I think it's important to ask ourselves to also what uh, what should be important to us because sometimes we're off track and we don't we're not we say we get off track sometimes <coughs> and what we want is more important than what Heavenly Father wants. Yeah. I got lots of stories for that too. <laughs> what 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 are the things we should want? Well going along with that, just looking at our patriarchal blessings like the reading site, does that will give us a, a clue or an idea of what we should do. Things that God knows we need reading to do. Reading our patriarchal blessings. Um, it's also from the reading. I found it interesting when you say, uh, if you can't ask your goal to God, then it's good enough. But if it's you can't ask them, that means it's not good enough. Yeah. One point in my life, I had a Mustang, 1995 Mustang ZT convertible, had a roll bar on it. Yeah. You know, and it was important to me. We paid cash for it. All we, we were accomplishing all our other goals. I, I couldn't ask for that right now because my my goals in my life. But yeah, if you can pray about it, it makes it a, a serious one. Yes? Um, I was going to say, kind of in the mind of what I before, I was talking about with family, um, with spouse, with, you know, as your parents are involved with that. Can we take a goal and can we use that to help us to figure out what our values are, what are the things that are important? Would someone just like to just give me a goal and then we can kind of, I can kind of pick on you a little bit? To, it's a real, it's, it's a pretty simple process because you take the goal and you say, why is this important to you? And then they'll give a reason. And then they'll say, well, then we'll ask the question, why is that important to you? They'll give reason three. And as, if you're willing to, to push really deeply, you can find out 
Volunteering to be a guinea pig? Sure. So tell us the goal. Uh, I think it would be really awesome. My goal is to own my own room by the time I'm 30. Own your own what? Um, or own your own home. home. So, so remind me your first name? Elliot. 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 Okay, Elliot. Um, why is it important for you to own your home? First of all, let's do the first one. Why is it important for you to own your first home? Uh, so it frees up a lot of other money that would be spent on mortgages that you could put towards your children. Okay, so why do you want to free up this additional money? So you said so you can put towards your children. Why do you want to spend money on your children? <coughs> uh, because if you want them to have more than you have, right? Uh, so why is it important for your children to have more, more than you have? Uh, so you have more children, you can buy more options. Why is it important for you for your children to have more options, more choices and options? So you see, the easy one is the first two or three. Now we're getting into the heavy. But if you won't stop at three, if you'll take it to four or five or six. So let, do you mind if I can do that? No, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So Elliot, well, why is it important for your children to have options? Um, choices that, may, like, that, may, that maybe you didn't have. Yeah, because I, I feel like maybe I was a little bit limited in like my options in life and where I went. Or... So why is it important that your children have the options that you didn't have in life? Uh, no regrets. Maybe so they have no regrets. So no regrets. And so they, they have all the options presented to them. And so it was, you know, Why is it important that your children have all the options presented? Uh, so that you have Why is it important that your children have That's what God wants. So the, we can see the value behind it is because he wants his children to be happy to be able to accomplish the things because that's what so you notice how we pushed it, and it's a little bit uncomfortable. And then we can take the second part of it. Why do you want to? Why do you want to have your house paid off by age thirty? And so, but but you see the process here. I'm more concerned about the process than this. And Elliot, I, I appreciate you being willing to, to to share. But but that's what we want. You know, and Elliot was concerned about the things that he wants to make sure his kids have the opportunities that he didn't have. My wife and I, we just changed, I had, I had three goals. I, my wife and I added our fourth, fourth goal a couple months ago, and that is we want to give our children all the things that money cannot buy. Sometimes we're so concerned about giving them the things that money can buy that we want to give them the things that money can buy. But, but, but that's how we do it. And I encourage each of you as you put your goals together, to use that. We're trying to understand what our core values are. And so what, what is important about whatever it was to you, and take it back a step, and take it back a step. And usually about the fifth or sixth time, you start getting down to the things that are really important. Um, any thoughts on the relationship between money and happiness? Someone said money isn't everything, but whatever is in second place is sure a long way behind. <laughs> What's the relationship? Yes. Uh, I thought it was interesting something I read once. How they, they kind of monetize a little bit where they figured out people tend to be <coughs> happiest until about $72,000. Mm -hmm. And then after that, like money had no place in it. Yeah. It was how you lived your lifestyle. How lived your lifestyle. So is it he, he who stands tall, happiest when he stands on his wallet? Is that kind of thing? I worked in an industry that had very high salaries. We were all paid more than we were worth. And I know lots of miserable people who are making seven-figure income. My wife tells us going to Uganda with a group called uh, Goals for Girls, Health International. And she talked about the happiness of these people and they have none. Is there a relationship? And are we sometimes so concerned about giving our kids the things that we didn't have that we fail to give them the things that we do have? Or give them the important things? Sometimes it's important to sit back and you know, take a perspective. Um, kind of take that eternal perspective. Um, here's a, another question. Why do we set why do we set goals? The second one is what happens if we don't set goals? Why don't we spend a couple of minutes in our groups and let's just talk about why do we set goals? 
Stretch us and help us to be motivated. Babylon. I read through all of those things. 
But it's interesting, you know, I got an email from someone who knew me from 30 years previously, and she said, um, she said, you used to be really into the power of positive thinking. She says, what are you into now? <laughs> and I thought, I'm into trying to understand and to be more Christ-like followers, because that's where the truth is. True area comes in. It goes like this, and it's by Jesse Rittenhouse. It's from Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. It says, I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I beg good evening when I counted my standing store. For life is a just employer. He will give you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why you must grab the task. I work for a menial's hire, only to learn this may, that any wage I would have asked of mine. What does that mean? Why would that be in a book on thinking grow rich? What's the purpose behind that form? Yes. I feel like you oh. set your own expectations, right? I mean, like we have heard in the business school that average like starting salary is like certain amount. Like there's like a range. But I mean like if you put that in your mind, you're already kind of tainted. I mean we can take whatever we want in life. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, um, like in life, the sky's the limit. We can really accomplish all that we want to accomplish, but if we don't set goals to reach those, those kind of things we want to accomplish in life, we're just going to kind of go through the motions and never really reach that potential. Other thoughts? Bow, were you raising your hand? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So a lot of time in life, the only one that sells ourselves short is us. We often don't. We're willing to settle for less because whether we're scared, we don't want to try it, we don't want to just go for it, and so we often just settle for less than what we should. Is it Curtis? Yes. You got a yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we settled for less. I'm 58. I'm 57. I'll be 58 this month. I don't even know my birthday. Um, but I look back and I say, I could have accomplished a lot more had I been more diligent. Any wage that I would ask of life, and I What happens if we don't set goals? And do the exact opposite of what we have now. Do you think we're moving more toward a nation of people who set goals or people who don't set goals? Um, it's kind of interesting when we're in primary, what do they have? They teach about setting goals. It's called, what's it called? Your Faith in God program. And then we go into young men and young women, and young men have duty to God, and the young women have personal progress. And then we get to be college age, and then what do we have? School. School. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely not. We should have learned by that. Yeah, we should have learned by that. <laughs> but, but that is the challenge. How, how do you set real goals? Someone said a goal not written is only a wish. Is there a difference between a, a goal and a real goal? And my goal to buy another Mustang GT convertible to me is not a real goal. But is there a difference? Yes. Yeah, I feel like a real goal is, like, like I said, something you've written down, but it's also attainable or realistic. It's not impossible in under current circumstances. And it's something you've actually planned to get achieved. So it's it's something you plan, it's attainable. Hey, I know there are few times when I when I thought to myself, oh, I want something, but in truth, I really didn't want that. I, uh, I wasn't willing to do it to totally get that thing. So sometimes we say, oh, it'd be nice to have this, but we're not willing to do it. Not willing to do the steps that require it. It also reminds me of my brother. He says, one of the happiest times of my life when he bought his truck. The second happiest time was when he sold his truck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we talk about we'd like a goal, but we're not willing to put the time and the effort into it. And so would it be a real goal? We'd be one that we're willing to put the time and the effort into you know, I have a goal to write my, you know, do my, my budgeting at once a week and do my journal every week, and I'm finding that it gets hard. And so I'm thinking instead of doing it every week, I'm going to have to go and do it every day, and to make the time. So I started doing that in, in, on my smartphone, <coughs> habits, whatever this one is, notes. So I'm writing my journals every night before we go to bed. My wife and I will sit up here on the iPhones and write our, write our journals, but. We have to make it a priority. Um, le let me share some things that I found successful uh, 
in applying real goals. Um, Share a quote. Um, can I get you to read that for me, please? I am so thoroughly convinced that if we don't set goals in our life and learn how to master the techniques of living to reach our goals, we can reach a ripe old age and look back on our life only to see that we reached but a small part of our potential. When one learns to master the principles of setting a goal, he will then be able to make a great difference in the results he attains in his life. I have used this quote <coughs> for eight years, and I've always pushed out, you know, what's, we, what one learns to master the principles of setting a goal. And that's what we'll talk about, what are the principles of setting a goal. But over the last one, but I've also read to master the techniques of living to reach our goals. That's an important one, too. But the first of all, so what are the what are the principles of setting the goal? So let, let me just share some things that have made a difference in my life, the lives of my family. And there's kind of nine principles. Number one, determine what Heavenly Father wants you to be. You know, this is probably one of the, the hardest things that you'll ever do. I know some people here are, are not L LDS. So think about what are the things that your parents want you to do? Or what are the things that God wants you to do? Um, so the few, the, probably the most critical thing is what would he have to do? What's your mission in life? What are his plans for you? And realize that you could do no better than what he would have to do. There are times when I life and I thought that I knew more than what David said. I knew more than what Heavenly Father said. And I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And needless to say, every time I, I did that point, that it came back to, to be not as good. And if you realize that there's no one who loves you like your father, like no one who knows you, why would you not listen to the person who's the most knowledgeable? I'm in the area, of, uh, I work in the area of investment management, investment analysis. Would I love to go spend some time with Warren Buffett? I would. You know, and there's a number of other ones, portfolio members, I'd love to spend time with because these are people who truly know. But we have a Father in Heaven who knows more about investing than we knows more about each of these other things. And we, we read this quote here. So the first thing is, sorry, that's on vibrate. Number two is we seek his help. So try to figure it out, and, and, and we ask his help. And we've been promised that if, if we ask, we'll receive. But the question is, how do we seek his help? We've been admonished to counsel, counsel with the Lord. And so I, I hate to say it, it comes back to the basic. I call them the Sunday school answers. I do the basic stuff. Read your scriptures. You know, are, are we doing that? We've been told that the, the Holy Ghost will teach us all things we should do and bring all things to our remembrance. But it won't bring things back that we haven't read. So read the scriptures. <coughs> Remember, we're told to seek wisdom even by standing by faith. Number two, guidance through prayer. We need to make prayer part of our lives. Um, and we need to realize it's important. I, I, there's lots of people who don't understand the importance of prayer. I had this discussion with a friend. And she said, she asked me this question yesterday. And she says, do you pray to God? And I said, yes, every day. What a privilege that is to have. Not only does the, do I pray, but I get answers to it. And one of my challenges as a dad is to teach my children to come here. Because if I can teach them that, then they can find answers on their own. Number three, read. If you've got a patriarchal blessing, read. <coughs> because this is the guidance that Heavenly Father would have, have you have. At age 15, I had a patriarchal blessing that said three words. It said, get a doctor. No one in my family had ever graduated from college. 
my aunt. I got the patriarchal blessing from my, fa my grandfather. And she says, oh, you don't have to do that. Because grandpa was just concerned about education. My eldest born president said, I'd never go back and get a PhD unless someone else would pay for it. You've got to realize, I'm a person who had a 3-4 GPA here at BYU, so I'm not what you call one of the sharper people. But you know, I did. Because of that, we, we set the goals and we did the things and it's made all the difference. My President Benson said this. Can I just um, can I get you to read that for me, please? Yeah. Receive a patriarchal blessing. Study it carefully and regard it as a as personal scripture to you. For that is what it is. The patriarchal blessing is the inspired and prophetic statement for your life's mission together with blessings, cautions, and admonitions as a patriarch may be prompted to give. Receive your patriarchal blessing under the influence of fasting and prayer, and then read it regularly that you may know God's will for you. Remember fathers and priestly blessings. Are you giving priestly blessings to your kids if you're married? I started when I was about five, and every year I got father's blessing, except for the two years that I was on my mission. And then after that, I had father's blessings every year until my dad passed away. I was going back to George Washington. We got accepted to George Washington University again. I'm, I graduated in the top 70% of my MBA class here at BYU. Uh, again, I was a real good student. <laughs> in that blessing, my dad said, he says, I bless you that you will be able to work beyond your natural abilities. And it hit me like a rock. The Heavenly Father gives us our abilities. Can he, can't he help us to work? And from that day in 1984 until now, I don't think there's been a day gone by that I haven't prayed that my wife and myself and my children can work beyond our natural abilities. <coughs> Attend the temple. You know, I, 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 we've got, there's power in the temple. So for those who have the ability and have temple reckons, I encourage you to use it. There's power in the temple to help us to accomplish our things. Take I had a comment and said, it's interesting, when I was in my undergrad here at BYU, I had a friend of mine challenge me to go to the temple every week. I thought, I just don't have time, there's no way I can do this. And, um, and I finally started to try, and, and, and I, as I went, after a couple months, I remember sitting in the parking lot and talking to other father going, I don't feel any different, like, what, what's going on here? And he, you know, the Spirit whispered to me and said, forget focusing on what you're getting out of this and focus on what you're doing for others. <coughs> and as I did it for about two and a half years, I looked back and I realized that the powerful fundamental change that occurred to me um, was too small to measure on a week-to-week -week basis or a month-to-month -month basis, but it had accumulated over those two and a half times. And I realized that some of the most powerful personal revelations I'd ever received in the celestial room before the temple during that time period. And, um, and I, I just fully attest to the power of this and, and, and will allow the Lord to guide you. <coughs> Remember thinking that sometimes I was too busy to do the things that I need to do. In fact, right now I'm teaching five classes with five preps, which is kind of a busy schedule. <coughs> but my wife goes down to the Family History Library every Wednesday from 10 to 12. And even with as busy as I am, I decided, you know, for the last year or two, I, I've been there at least for an hour, and I thought I'm going to continue that because I need that, that guidance. And so, there's power. So number one, what would Heavenly Father have you to do? Number two, seek Heavenly Father's help. And after all, it's a divine mission that we all have. It's a mission that he's given us. And wouldn't he want to help us to accomplish the mission that he's given us? Number three, start with the end in mind. I like the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says, start with the end in mind is one of his habits. He says, start by writing your obituary. How do you want to be remembered? Is it money? Do you really care the size of your investment portfolio when you die? Do you think people would say, he was a really good guy. He died for $5.2 million in this thing. Or he drove a really fast car. I mean, and he had this really cool house on the end of you know, at, at Windsor or whatever lane you want to say. Is that, that really going to make a difference? Where do we spend our time? Think about it now while you're in school. How do you want to be remembered? And you've got to write it. I want you to write your epitaph. Um, let's say, if you had a week to live, one, one way to figure out to start with the end in mind, if you had a week to live, which, what would you do? I wouldn't be here teaching. You know. So, what would you do if you had a week to live? What would, what, who would you spend time with? 
what would you do? Without my kids, we'd go out. We'd probably be up at Sundance with them at Park City or something like that, just being with my kids. Would it be more work more hours at the office? Would, would it be if you had a week to live, would you buy that new car? Would it be that build that new huge house? If you had a month to live, if I had a month to live, I'd probably still be here. <coughs> I like TV. But, but think about those things. What would you be doing if you had a, a month to live? And think about if you only had one year to live. What would that? It'll help you to prioritize your goals. This morning, my wife and I slept in until 5.30. It was just too cold to run. So, she said, so we're going to take the dog for a walk. We have two steps out there, and the overhang on the house causes uh, water. And she took a step, and she just fell. She went right on, she hit her head against the, the curb. And I'm just going, I just died. You know, and, and, and she goes, oh, I'm okay. I did, so I helped her in the house. She said, I just need to lay down and get me some ice. So I got her some ice, and she was just laying on the carpet there. And, and as I was taking the dog out, <laughs> the dog to hurry and go to the bathroom, you know, I'm thinking, what would happen if something happened to him? My wife, what would happen? And I was just, that's the last thing. But, but what are the things that are important to you? What are the things that are important? So number four, write down your goals. Someone said, a goal not written is only a wish. What do you enjoy doing? What are the things that make you enjoy life? What are the things you like to do with your wife and your kids? My kids like to play. There's a game called Werewolf. Oh, I love it. What is it? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we play that game on Sundays. You, you know, it's a Sunday, Sunday game, and we're teaching people to lie and to cheat and to kill. <laughs> Good priorities. But it's a, it's a fun game, but my kids like it. Uh, but what do you like doing with your spouse and your kids? But write them down. Um, once you've written them down, think about them. Are they what you should be working toward? And pray about them. You know, that's probably one of the most difficult things to have. Um, well, and let me step back. Um, goals will change, too. I have a home teacher, and he, he came by. Um, and his wife talked about when he was 55, he ran his first marathon. And about this time, I was like, I was 54, and I thought, that'd be kind of fun. And so my, I wrote down a goal to run a marathon. And I ran my first marathon at 55, I ran two more at 56, we ran a half marathon. You know, but the point is, is we can do that. There's nothing, the only thing that can stop us from these things is ourselves. Now my wife and I realize marathons are, you know, as, as long as you take your time and you prepare well, you can accomplish all these things. Now marathons are just too much time to prepare, so we'll do we do half them. <laughs> so, but keep your goals smart. We've all been through the smart, specific, measurable, <coughs> achievable, reportable, time bound or time. But if we can make those goals we can do this, then it makes it a lot, a lot easier. And make sure, as we said earlier, that these are goals you're really willing to spend time with. And then review your goals off and make them observable. I had a goal. I've got to be careful about talking about my goals in this class because if, if, if one semester I talked about having a goal and I'm trying to reduce the amount. My, my wife, the time my wife and I go out to dinner. And then about three weeks later, one of the students in the class was a waiter at this restaurant, and my wife and I went to dinner. And after he served us, he says, is this the way you and your wife continue to work on your goals to reduce your restaurant expenses? <laughs> so you got to be careful. <laughs> but, but if you make your goals observable, then, then it's a greater chance. I have a goal that I don't watch TV except when my kids are watching TV. So there's no question on who, who has the power of a remote in our family. Because it's always my wife or my kids. Sometimes when my wife leaves, she goes takes the kids down to Disneyland. I get really bored. <laughs> and I've actually watched TV sometimes. But my kids will come in and say, Dad, is this, this how you work on your goal? Want to watch TV? <laughs> and so we get a lot of help. Notice my goal to learn each of your names, too. 
if I let you know that that is a goal of mine, does that make sense? <coughs> now I've got other people helping me. It's like Derek. I knew, I knew Derek when he was born. Because I went, I, we were at Falls Church, Arlington, Virginia with his parents. In fact, yeah. So, I, so the point is, but by letting everybody here know that that's a goal I have, do I have incentive to fulfill them? Yes, you really want help accomplishing a goal? Tell your kids. <laughs> and they will help you out. Number seven, remember goals may change. When we were back in, um, back in Walnut Creek, we bought a boat. And it was a master craft. And you know, I had to say, I have brothers who are very good at water skiing. When I was a missionary, my, my, my brother and three of his friends, I got a picture of all three of them were barefooting behind a boat on New Year's Day in California. And I thought, I want to learn to barefoot. And so when we bought the boat, we had to throw in a, a barefoot bar as well. I don't know if any of you know about barefooting. It is really gymnastics at 40 miles an hour. That's all it is. If you're, you've got big feet like I do, it's a lot easier because of that. And so I had a goal that I wanted to learn barefoot. And um, so we found one day that the water was pretty good. And, you know, I basically told them, I had no idea what I was doing. I just told my wife, just keep it at 40 miles an hour. And what, what a barefoot bar is, is comes from the ski pylon, it comes over here, it comes up, and then it goes out. And so it's right about, you've got, you're about six foot from the side of the boat. And so the boat goes 40 miles an hour, and you kind of just belly out on the bar. And then you, you kind of lean back here, and then you just put your foot down, feet down, and then you put, take the pressure. Pretty soon you, the, the, the water's going so fast under your <coughs> feet that it gives upward pressure. And then once you've got that, then you go to the air. Then you have a little rope, a couple foot rope, and then you just bear foot again. Well, needless to say, I didn't understand the principles of this. And by the time, you know, after trying five or six times, I don't know if you, if you know what it's like to fall flat on your face at 40 miles an hour. It's not the most exciting thing. Um, but when I came back, I had bruises all the entire inside. And I just said, you know what? I said, that goal is really not important to me. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, I later took uh, some MBAs who knew what they were doing. We had dry suits and everything. They, they took me out and they showed me barefoot was going down that time. But, uh, but realize your goals will change over time. Um, and, and the point here is realize our goals are written in paper and not in stone. But as we, we work on the goals, we need to be flexible. And the scriptures tell us, let the solemnities of eternity rest on your soul and mind forever. And if we'll, we'll keep an eternal perspective, we will accomplish so much more. And then finally, have some fun goals. You know, make sure you write some fun goals. My wife had a goal to be in a, at one of the church pageants. Because of that, we're now actually on staff at Dalton Pageant. We go for the next five years. We've done it five times in the next five years we'll be going on. I want to climb Pilot Peak. I want to do a number of things, but have some fun goals. I had a goal. I had a goal to take my entire family down the Grand Canyon. And we did it last year. I took my, my wife and my three young kids. So have fun goals. And then the last thing too, remember that the success of a goal is not measured by achievement, but by effort. Um, can I get you to read this for me, please? Set your goals without goals you can't measure your progress, but don't become frustrated because there are no obvious victories. Remind yourself that striving can be more important than arriving. If you are striving for excellence, if you are trying your best day by day, the wisest use of your time and energy to reach your goals, you are a success. Some of our goals, we cannot control the outcome, but we can control the energy. <coughs> So realize that if we are putting in the effort, then we are a success. Um, questions on setting real goals? So what I'd like you to do is to start thinking about your goals. What do you want to accomplish? What are the things that are important to you? Start answering that question. What would Heavenly Father want you to do? And again, I go back to that comment from uh, from that, that question at, uh, at that conference I was last year. What difference do you have from being a faith-based institution versus me at a normal college? How is what you teach different? And I think a lot of it is 
we have we believe that Heavenly Father can help us accomplish our goals. So we have to make sure that the goals are consistent with what, what He would have us do. So what goals are is really goals are to help us to change. So what do you think research has found? What do you think research has found when it comes to helping people change? Is it easy to help people change? It's not. There's actually another PowerPoint that I put up there. It's called uh, Guidelines for Helping Others from Elder Ballard's talk, OB Wise. But it gives you some, some thoughts. And he gives us principles. Principle one, focus on people and principles, not programs. Two, be innovative in your desire to help. Three, divide the work and delegate responsibility. Four, eliminate <coughs> guilt, motivate with love. Five, thoughtfully allocate your resources of time, income, and energy. And six, six have pure motive. And seven, help them find the answers themselves. But that, that's a PowerPoint and has some thoughts on there. But what do you think research has shown about the study of helping people change? Let me just share. This is, this is from um, David uh, Meister, Strategy and the Fat Smoker. He says this, much of what professional firms do in the name of strategic planning is a complete waste of time. No more effective than individuals making New Year's resolutions. The reasons are the same in both situations. Professionally and personally, we already know what we should do. Lose weight, give up smoking, exercise more. In business, strategic plans are also stuck with familiar goals. Build client relationships, act like team players. Provide fulfilling, motivating careers. We know the benefits of these things. We know what to do, we know why we should do it, and we know how to do it, yet we don't change most of us as individuals or businesses. The problem is that change efforts are based on the assumption that all you have to do is to explain to people that their life could be better, be convincing that the goals are worth going for, and show them how to do it. This is patently false. If this were true, there would be no drug addicts in the world, no alcoholics, no bad marriages. Oh, I see it's not good for me. Oh, well, then I'll stop, of course. What nonsense. So what do you think they found? So why we don't do it? He says, the primary reason we do not work in the areas in which we know we need to improve is that the rewards and pleasure are in the future. The disruption, discomfort, and discipline needed to change are there now. To reach our goals, we must first change our lifestyle, our daily habits, now. Then, when, then we have the courage to keep the new habits and not yield to the old familiar temptations. <coughs> then and only then we get the benefits. Debating which goals to pursue is a nonsensical process if you lack the discipline to stick with the different diet and exercise program that each of these requires. The only meaningful debate as to which diet you are really ready to do. Let me give some suggestions, six suggestions. Number one, it's about a permanent change in lifestyle. Major source of failure is that we underestimate how much effort is truly required to be about significant improvement. So if we're serious about these goals, we've got to realize that it's going to take a major change. You must be willing to make a permanent change in lifestyle. Number two, we must change the core scorecards. Strategy, if it's to be lived and achieved, is about modifying the very rules of daily living and scorekeeping. We all forgive ourselves too easily. We find it quite easy to live with guilt. Even high levels of guilt don't change people. Embarrassment, even in small doses, is far more effective. So, you know, my goal to learn everybody's names, you guys will know by the end of the semester if I've accomplished that objective. So embarrassment, telling your kids, telling your spouse. Leadership, number three, leadership gets serious or get out of the way. Organizations often rush to figure out how the troops need to change to live the new standards. However, this is not the first task. Perhaps the single bis bis biggest difficulty in getting an organization to stick to the diet is convincing them that top management really wants them to. If you're going to lead, get serious or get out of the way for someone who's ready to do. Number four, principles are more effective than tactics. Five people must volunteer, and six people must get on or get off the bus. Interesting things. So kind of, in summary, we talked about a whole bunch of stuff. Um, we 
talked about the role of financial planning in accomplishing our goals. We read Mike's email. What he wanted to do with it, the Stone nieces and nephews is really just help them start thinking through financial planning. We discussed the process. We have to figure out what's important to you. What are your values? Decide what you want. Evaluate your health. Set your goal. Define your goals. Develop a plan. Implement that plan. And then review and revise. In this class, we cover stages one to four. We talked about some of the requirements for the personal financial plan. I'll have you put in that binder together. We talked through personal goals. <coughs> what do you want out of life? And we talked about the difference between a goal and a real goal. And I believe a real goal is one that we can see can we talked about what happens if we don't set goals, with what the benefits of setting goals and what happens if we don't. Now, we just shared the Jesse Rittenhouse goal. No, we'll get out of life what we bargain for. But we are the ones who set the bargains. We are the ones who set the wages by the goals that we set. We talked on the nine steps of setting the goal. Determine what Heavenly Father wants you to do. Seek his help. Start with the end of the morning. Write down your goals. Keep your goals smart. Review, re, review your goals often. Put them in, on a mirror. Tell them to your spouse. Tell them to your kids. Tell them to your class. Remember your goals will change over time. Have some fun goals. Remember that success is measured not by achievement, by striving. And then we talked about how do you get people to change. And it's really, they have to buy it. Okay, questions. So you guys are all ready to start writing down your goals. <coughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on Tuesday. I'll start on Tuesday. I'll start sending around uh, the bowling sheet just because if you can hand in your individual education plan, I'll hand that. It usually takes a couple of days for people to decide if they really want to stay in the class. Or, okay. If you're questioning, I'll, I'll be up here.